Get a butt fever. That's right. That's right. <laughs> What's going on, guys? Hey, welcome to another episode of Tuesday Night Live, on Tenor Shimani YouTube channel. Sorry we missed last week. I was in Vermont, and um, I have to say, man, Vermont is a pretty cool place to go visit. If you've never been there, put it on your bucket list, man. It's like a, it's kind of like um, the Ozarks or even some of the southeast Missouri in the area that we live, but there's 2,000 foot mountains around, but it has a lot of the same kind of hardwood trees mixed in with pines and stuff. And it's, um, how's the weather? Very, the, the weather was, uh, the first two days, it was like high 60s. Um, and then the three or four days, it was 40s. Okay. And then when we left on Wednesday, there it was snowing. Really? Yeah. So winter's starting to happen there. Hmm. It was basically the same time we had that cold front here last week. When yeah. It got really cold and windy and stuff. That's what was going on up there. But um, okay. pretty cool, man. There's like all these maple, like maple syrups, like a big deal out there. Yeah. And yeah. you're just driving around and you see these little PVC pipes running along the sides of the woods. And then every once in a while, there'll be a junction and there'll be a tap that goes up in the woods that taps into a maple tree. And it's all going downhill. And then literally some of these some of these systems were like a half a mile long really? and then it finally gets to a spot like a low spot and there's a shack down there and they call that a sugar shack and all that <laughs> all that sap runs down to that sugar shack and then they say so that sugar shack <laughs> all yeah, the sap runs to the sugar, sap, shack. sugar shack that's tough man you gotta think about that and then <laughs> i guess they condense it down and boil it and then you know they make your maple, maple syrup. syrup and uh ice cream i had that's some of the best cool. maple ice cream ever Still there. We'll be back. There we are. Back. Yeah. Um, anyway, it was a great trip. Um, that's a place I could live. I didn't get to fish. My my brother was 20 minutes away from Lake Champlain, but we did get to go to the lake and and check it out. And uh man, it's a big, big, big body of water. Can't see the other side oh, of the God, it's unbelievable. <laughs> we we were flying over it. We landed in Burlington and uh just flying over it. It's like it's freaking massive. Yeah. I, I knew it was big on the map, but gosh, I mean, it was just, there's islands everywhere. And um, it's a place that I definitely want to go back to and spend some time. There's trout rivers everywhere. Just, it, it's, it's beautiful, man. It's really. Could you really, bomb out there? I, probably. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to try to go. Or would you rather be in Colorado? Man, I'd probably rather. You got to get a I'd probably rather be in Colorado, but that'd be, that'd be right up there too. So, yeah. um, uh, and you ever been out uh, in the north, north, uh, east at all, Eric? I've been to uh, Maryland. Uh, Chesapeake Bay was pretty cool. Uh, not, not to Vermont or Maine or you know none of them states like that. But been to New York. But uh, well, New York's got that same kind of yeah, um, same kind of landscape. Upstate New York, at least. yeah, yeah. You Pennsylvania. Know, there, there's some pretty cool scenery in pennsylvania too i've been out there but it sounds a lot like uh just a couple weeks ago i was at lake washita in arkansas for the uh twisted cat championship down there and it's it's got a lot of that like the ozark mountain you know i mean it's it's pretty mountainous and big timbers it's real cool terrain i think that lake has like 200 islands it's 200 foot deep it's Wow. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. 40,000 acre lake. I think it was, it was pretty cool body of water, but it sounds real similar to what you were describing. Yeah. It, we got to see some of the, the leaves. I mean, that, that area is notorious for this fall foliage and the, and the, the vibrant colors. Uh, right. But most of the, most of the leaves were like that yellow orange. And he said, mm -hmm. my brother said that um, they've had a lot of rain this year and too much rain messes with the colors of the leaves the colors. kind of mutes the cover the the leaves and um and then a lot of them dropped too soon there was mm -hmm. hillsides that were the, the leaves that already dropped but we did get to see you know some pretty good yellowish yellow i'll tell you what so we was, had some great color around here this year we did yeah, there I mean, was some we, when we were up in northern missouri uh deer hunting we there was one corner that you would go by and it was just yellows and bright oranges and the deep reds it's like oh my gosh like this is 
this is what it's all about. And you kind of slow down around that corner as you, as you're driving back to the, the cabin that we stayed at. It's like, this is what it's all about guys. <laughs> so well, me and the wife, we took a drive a couple weekends in a row up through Marquette park up here by us. And, and it, uh, it changed a lot in one week, but we like to do it several times and as it's changing the colors and then we'll do it again when all the leaves hit the ground and you can really see through the timber and then big hills and stuff. And it's pretty cool. Right. Yeah. That, that's when you take your binoculars and you look and see what you're missing out there. Right? Oh yeah. We've seen a few big bucks up in there. On our drives. I came about that close to hitting like a 170 10 point last night. Oh man. Here? No yeah. wait. Yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was uh, it was out near my house. We were on the way back in from town. We went to supper last night, and it's coming back in. And I've been up in northern Missouri, and the deer in northern Missouri are huge. And I saw this deer stand on the side of the road, and I was like, oh, there's a little doe standing there. And as the the headlights came around, I just saw the rat like, come straight up. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> we raced, and there was a car coming at us, and cars behind us. There was no way to, like, slam on the brakes without – you know, having a, a giant accident. Unfortunately, he just turned and walked right right away. It's like, oh, thank you, Lord. Nice. Yeah. So, but it was he was an absolute giant. We, we had we were last night about nine thirty. We're just sitting in the living room. Well, actually, I'm downstairs and the girls are upstairs. And all of a sudden, I we we heard emergency response vehicles, one right after another, one right after another. They stopped right out here in front of tom's house really we couldn't figure out what was going on there was probably there was two or three fire trucks several uh sheriffs and uh, i think a tow truck and maybe an ambulance i'm not sure it was just it was chaos and first thing i did is go down and grab a shotgun and put three shells in it and put five in my pocket because i'm like i don't know what's going on and right. then they said there's somebody out there and there's a police officer out there in the field walking around out in our fields two of them one I don't know if they were on our side of the road. I think they were on the other side. So of the you road. never know what's going on. But I, yeah. So it made me think like somebody maybe got robbed and or the fleeing. guy took off right. and was fleeing. And so we made sure we locked all the doors and stuff. And um, it, it was, it was chaotic for a while. And we're kind of, they wouldn't let me go. I like to go outside. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll get in the shadows and just watch. I'm, I'm a guy, <laughs> I'm a guy that's going to get hit by a lightning or a tornado or, or, yeah. a bear attack or something because i'm gonna be right up in there trying to I'm, I'm just curious man they would not let me go outside and so i'm kind of peeping through the windows and long story short we found out this morning that somebody had just hit a deer out here and i don't know it must have been a slow night in fruitland missouri right because <laughs> there was all, everybody came out to see what was going on uh, but i think what was going on is the, the people the cops that were in the field were just looking the for the deer that's the only right. thing i could figure out and i I, I don't know what happened to the uh, the vehicle or if the person that was driving it was okay, but it it was hot and heavy for about 30 to 45 minutes and then just kind of fizzled. Well, and, and, and you guys don't know this, but he's out in the middle of nowhere, right? Like, struggle with internet out here. They, they bring the sunshine in in buckets out this far. <laughs> we ain't that far. <laughs> so, um, we do have electricity. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's not anything around. So you got flashing lights and sirens and yeah yeah the big right. the big city lights right like right where i, where I did live off of 61 it was we see well, that stuff happens constant. two or three times a day yeah but i hear something something with flashing lights goes by and sirens yeah we, we something always happen we always wonder attention. like when we get done with the when we get done with the stream we'll be outside talking it's like where are all these people going on a tuesday night at you know 10 30 11 o'clock why is there so much traffic on this road it'll be like three cars just <laughs> And then nothing for like 15 minutes and then three cars again. It's like, Man, where are y'all going? Yeah. Um, so where, do, where exactly do you live at, Eric? Uh, I'm in a small town called Bunker Hill, Illinois. It's uh, okay. about 18 miles north of Alton. Gotcha. Um, 35 miles north of St. Louis, I guess, or 40, something like that. So did you grow up in that area? or I've lived here my whole life, yeah. I don't know if I ever really grew up, but I've lived here my whole life. <laughs> hey, that's a way to be. Childish, so, Ain't you no know, reason to yeah, grow up, right? Yeah, that's for nah. that's old people. You know that's right. <laughs> Todd said he caught his P PB flathead. I, I bet it was at Cedar Summer Fishing. I caught, bass. I caught one on live scope. I guess it was – I didn't weigh it, but it was either this past summer or the summer before. 
I was swimming a jig over a brush pile and it just goes dong. Mm-hmm. I set the hook and it goes whoom. It's like that's not a bad. <laughs> it was instant. I mean, you set the hook and he just dang near drug me back in the lake. Yeah. And I, yeah. he was a, I would say he was pushing 20, 25 pounds, which is a giant flathead for that lake. Uh, that's a good flathead anywhere. Yeah. And it was a, he was real modeled up, real pretty. Of course, that was the day I don't, I'm not running any cameras or anything. So, yeah. Those are the days. That's that how catch, it always works. Catch big ones and you don't have anything to get it on film with. So, got Ludwig 570. He's on, said he's on the border of Pennsylvania and New York, Northern Pike Territory. Yeah. Those play hell on a frog, don't they? Stephanie's PB is five pounder. What's your PB? Let's go flathead, channel, and blue since we're on that subject. Well, I'll start. Yeah. That, well, I, I don't have any recommendations. My, 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 my PB flathead is 65 pounds. Dang. Uh, this is all rod and reel. Uh, 65 pounds on the flathead, 20 pounds on the channel cat, and 80 pounds on the blue. Okay. That's some pretty pretty big fish all around. Now, you guide, right? No. No. You don't guide. I, I'm, I'm kicking it around. I've been kind of working on it a little bit on the guide. Uh, I do live scope classes. Okay. Uh, on the water, you know, on, on your boat, you know what I mean? Uh, set them up, teach them how to use it. Uh, but but not fishing guide just yet. Uh, I got you. It's kind of in the works. Okay, cool, cool. I'm thinking my PB flathead is probably 20-ish. Channel's probably 15, and blue's probably 25. It's been a long time. I used to catfish a lot. Um, I had a buddy that had a boat set up for it. Um, well, I say set up for it, but it was just a 17 foot bass tracker, but he had, he had anchors and things that, you know, you would use to, uh, to go out on the river and fish. And we put in down here at, in Cape, there's a couple boat ramps. Well, there's actually one down here at Cape and then there's one across the river at, uh, Thebes. And we'd kind of fish this area. We, we probably wouldn't go more than, oh, 10, maybe 15 miles north of this area. And we'd go a little bit south, but we, we'd do that. Heck, we'd do that 10 times a year for sure just in the warm months and but it was always like sunny sunny stick bait that you know you put the little catfish worm that had trouble coming yeah. out the bottom yeah. that dip bait that's mm-hmm. mainly what we used and and you're not gonna normally you're not gonna catch really big fish but we we caught some we catch some 15 pounders you know but most of the fish you're catching are like two to eight pounds probably on that on that stick that's bait. a cool looking stretch of river down there at cape that is a there is a ton of rocks uh, under the water. I mean, it, that is just a really cool looking stretch. We when I, we pre-fished it and found a bunch of flathead when we had a, a tournament down there. We we caught a bunch of flathead. wasn't what we were looking for, but I mean, mm-hmm. we stumbled into quite a few right up in the rocks. You know, it was it was a pretty cool looking area. It was really cool. What last year, a year before, when the the river was so low. And you could see, like, what folks don't realize is how how shallow the Mississippi really is. Yeah, it it's not it's nothing. There's there's areas right there out in front of Red Star that are two three foot deep, but it's rolling across it. You'd never know. Yeah, and then you roll off into the channel, and the channel in some spots is only what 10, 15 foot deep. And when the river's low, it, yeah. And so, I mean, at, at times, it. I think it got low enough. They shut barge traffic down the last year, the year before on that. Yeah, they like were doing right. a lot of dredging out in front of uh, us here at Cape. Yeah. So, just trying to keep. I, I would assume just trying to keep some traffic going. Well, the the thing the thing about the river is, and, and you know this more than me, probably Eric, but uh, it's it's a it's a living organism. It's moving oh, around. Absolutely. The sand, the sand just it's constantly around. changing. Yeah, and, and, and uh, even more so, like in you guys' area, you know, you get below the confluence of the Missouri and stuff. There's no more lock and dams, so I mean, it's it's constantly moving heavy, right you know, mm-hmm. down there, and and the bottom's changing a lot, a lot more sand in that area down there than there is above the confluence, and it's definitely definitely changing a lot. So you got to have respect for that river. I can tell you that. 
Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and good electronics goes a long ways. They, I mean, not only for finding your fish and, and your contour lines and, and, uh, uh, your depths and everything, but for marking the buoys, for marking the, the dikes and everything, the, 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 the good electronics mark all that. And I, it helped keeps you safe, you know, right. and they mark it pretty well. Yeah. The, my first experience was, I believe we were bow hunting on the off of an island that's public ground that we can get to, uh, but you can only access it's an island, so you can only access it by boat. Well, we were running, my buddy ran the river quite a while and we were running down and all of a sudden it just picks us up and moves us over about 10 feet and sets us back down. <laughs> and you know exactly what I'm talking about, Eric, if you've Absolutely. ever experienced that kind of current, it literally just picks you up and moves you over. It it's, work. it's the weirdest feeling uh, literally under your butt. It, it's crazy. It yep. feels weird. We were running probably 35, 40 mile an hour. Yeah. And it just shoot, shoot, shoot. And I looked over at him like, what was that? And he, he's, you know, locked on. He's not, didn't turn the wheel or anything. I'm no, like, that's that the best thing like? you can do. You stay under power and you just, you drive straight through it. Yep. And just, I mean, just hang on tight and just stay under power. It and was about like you, that. It was puckered up pretty tight. I promise you. Well, yeah. <laughs> oh, definitely. I know exactly what you're talking about. I don't know, one, you ever been over like one of the craziest stretches around here is is right at Cape Rock, um, which is north of which Harvard. is north of you know, Cape. Yep. But there's a the the river gets really deep right there, and you get like a kind of a vertical eddy thing going. And I remember years ago we'd be running through there, and there's actually uh, like whirlpools. You know, there's there's Absolutely. like there's like legitimate whirlpools, not, not enough to suck your boat in, but enough to where the front of your boat has to go across them for about three feet or four right. feet to get to the other side of it. And oh it's, yeah. It's Absolutely. scary. The Missouri river is notorious for that. We fish it quite a bit too. And it's, there's no locking dams in the Missouri. It's free flow and it just has wing, di uh, wing dikes. And it's notorious for that. I mean, there there's whirlpools, big, big whirlpools all over it. Hmm. And it's, it's, it's a little insane, you know, when you first get on it, the first few times on there, it's, it's intimidating. Right. Mm -hmm. Like you said, I mean, you just respect the river, you know, yep. always. And, yep. and it, there's a few things you always want to have in your boat when you're on the river. Um, that's a good anchor and a hundred foot of anchor rope. Because uh, I mean, if you run into catastrophic failure on your motor or trolling motor, you want to, you want to be able to stop yourself. And hold until you can get some help. And uh, if you can't, you're drifting wherever it takes you. Mm. So a hundred foot anchor rope at least, and a good anchor. That that's a good thing to have. Uh, marine radio, another great thing to have. You know, of course, always the life jackets and fire extinguishers, standard stuff. But that I I know personally know several people that that anchor has been the difference in them having a very bad day. And them just needing somebody to come out and tow them back home. Hmm. So. Well, and you, what if you've been on the river, whether it's the Missouri, whether it's the Mississippi, any river, you you don't realize how fast they're going until you're in a boat that's not under power. Yeah, or or, you're, or, or you're heading towards a dike, or that you're <laughs> under power and you're not going anywhere. Oh yeah. So I mean, absolutely. I, I, I'm pretty sure Spotlock doesn't hold you in the Mississippi River. It, it depends. I got, I just have an 1860 roughneck. Okay. But I got a 36 volt 112 thrust Tarova on it. That's sounds like an overkill for that boat, but I fished a river a lot. Mm -hmm. That trolling motor holds that boat uh, 90% of the time. Okay. okay. When it's, when it's up hard and running fast, it won't even hold my boat. Gotcha. But, but most of the time, It'll it'll hold my boat, but my boat's lighter than a lot of the the big traditional catfish boats, the sea arc boats, and and stuff. But it, it'll hold it, and which comes in handy because I do a lot of things on the river other than catfishing. The uh, the white bass and hybrid striper fishery out there is phenomenal, mm -hmm. and it's it's way underfished. Hmm. I've seen guys. <laughs> A couple different times in a like a 14 foot John boat with like a seven and a half horsepower motor. <laughs> There'll be three of them in there. And there's about 
four inches of boat showing. Yeah. Yeah. No life jackets. Yeah. That's to me, to me, that's insanity. I mean, I would never be one of them three in the boat. No, No. that's a death wish. I'll be the guy, I'll be the guy back at the ramp waiting on the phone call, like, I'll come get you, you know, if you're alive. Right. I just, to me, that I don't know, that's like disrespect to the river because you're asking for trouble. I mean, and then I seen guys out there do it and never have a problem, but man, it just, Scares me. I wouldn't. It's do it that. one time though. That one. It's only going to take one That's time. It. Yeah. I mean, I, I've got coming back for it after Matt. that. I've got stories from buddies, dads that I mean, heck, back in the you know the sixties and the seventies. That's all they had was a fourteen foot John boat with a seven and a half tiller handle, and they would run the edges of the river. If a barge comes, you go out in the middle because it's going to wash you up on the bank if you don't. So yeah. they would. I mean, it sounds crazy, yeah, but no, they're going to pick up that boat and it's going to roll you over yeah. three or four times oh, it, before you. Yeah. But yeah. they would duck hunt the river, be out there with a little, you know, a, a five D cell mag light running up and down the river. Oh like it was God. nothing. So, yeah, I mean, that's how they grew up. And I mean, you know, they weren't scared of nothing, I guess, but that's how they fed their family though, too. So big, big difference when they're, when you're out there hunting and, and taking care of your family versus just going out there and playing. So I would never do that now. Like no. not a chance. I would take no. my rig out there. So all right, let's dive into some catfish talk. Uh Todd's okay. got a question. He says, Eric, do you find the catfish grow bigger in the rivers than lakes? And which do you prefer? Uh I, I feel they they do grow bigger and faster in the in the rivers, the Mississippi, Missouri, especially. I mean they have such an abundance of food. Uh, then there's, there is no thermocline, you know, there's not near the stress on the fish in the rivers. There is in the lakes, you know, uh, and, and the abundance of food is everything. And I mean, the, they grow good in the lakes too. Um, I've caught some, I've caught some good blues in some of the lakes and some of the lakes that, that have a lot of shad and stuff, they can grow fast, but, I would definitely say the river over lakes uh, for bigger, bigger fish and and faster growing anyway. What about the Missouri versus the Mississippi versus the Ohio? Which which one do you think holds more bigger fit, you know, has a bigger population of bigger fish? And then which one do you think has a better population of if you just want to go out and, and catch some? you know, two to 10 pound fish. It depends. It depends on, on what you have at a particular spot in the river, like St. Louis, it has the granaries and stuff. It it holds an obscene amount of fish. The eater fish that you're talking about there, there's an unreal amount of fish down there. Anywhere you have granaries, you're going to have large amounts of those type of fish. Um, the Missouri are they, feed, are they feeding on that grain? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay. They feed on the grain and uh, the other fish, the carp, the drum. I mean, the other fish feed on it too. The big blues, they'll come up there and eat the other fish that are feeding on the grain. I mean, hmm. they're they're a massive predator. So, I mean, they're not going to pass up an opportunity like that, but. Yeah, some some days, I mean, you'll catch the catfish down there. And if you keep some, at the end of the day, you're going to have a pile of grain in the live well. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, it's, it, so granaries are a big difference. Um, the Ohio has a lot of mussel beds in it, which are very productive. I haven't fished the Ohio uh, not much at all, but I, I, I know some guys that do and and – Man, the mussel beds seem to produce a lot of fish. Um, and number wise, I think they catch a lot of a lot of blues in the Ohio. I think the bigger fish are more more in the Mississippi and the Missouri. The Missouri has it, it's put out a lot of really big fish, um, and it's notorious in the winter time for for puking out hundred pounders. Mm-hmm. I'm, I mean, January, February. I mean, it, there's some really big fish get caught there. Huh. So it's any one of those rivers. Um, 
I mean, you can have the same fish in its in its lifespan swim all three of those rivers pretty easy because they're right. not that there's not that much terrain. And I I believe they do do a certain degree of migrating. Um, so I mean it, it it wouldn't surprise me a bit for a fish to to have spent time in all of them, but any of them could grow a giant, but I know the St. Louis area around, you know, the confluence and I mean, it, it has notoriously spit out hundred pound fish. Jeez. Um, it's, I mean, it, it's a special place for a, for a big fish. Yeah. I noticed, um, listening to the Bluff city outdoors podcast that, um, I know Mark's always talking about, and, and you as well, it's like like the post, like May, is, isn't there like a May and June time frame where it seems like some 100-pounders pop up? There's a certain month or two where it seems it, like it's, they're more likely to see those bigger ones. Early um, early in the year like that, like in what most people call the fishing season, I guess, June, June typically is a very tough month because that's their spawn. Okay. And they're not like like some of the other fish, like the crappie. You can annihilate them on the spawn. The blue cat, you can't. I mean, they are tricky during the spawn, which typically is June. But right before that, in May, April, May, they're full weight. They're heavy. So if you're going to catch a giant, I mean, that's a good time to do it. Them big fish, them big fish may have they may have as much as ten pounds of eggs in them. Jeez. So I mean, that's a very good time. The winter time, January, February, some of the biggest fish I see get caught during that time. And uh, and then again, I mean, the fall, the fall is pretty good, too. But the, the pre-spawn, the pre-spawn is really good. I mean, it's like like largemouth fishing. I mean, if you mm -hmm. want that big trophy, that's a good time to catch it. Well, they're gonna be, like you said, they're going to be at their full weight. They're, they're feeding up, preparing for that 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 law i mean we're, we're in the in the middle of deer season right now and we're we're experiencing the same thing in the woods i know you said you got some time off work here but I, i've been in the woods you're experiencing the same thing they're out feeding they're getting ready for that that big push of of rut their spawn their mm -hmm. their time to go make uh make little deer and little bambies and blue cats are doing the same thing so just same way as everything else they're going to feed up they're going to be at their heaviest weight their biggest their fattest right before that season happens it doesn't matter what animal that is absolutely yeah. and and a blue cat too i mean you, that fish throughout the year its weight can fluctuate i mean its weight throughout one year could fluctuate i believe as much as as 15 pounds or more you know in, in a single season just one one fish i mean you know like largemouth, sometimes they'll they'll get on a feeding frenzy when they're gorging, and I mean you'll see you'll see a big tail fin of a shad in the back of its throat, and it's and it's got your big topwater spinnerbait hanging out of its mouth. It's like mm -hmm. where did he think he was going to put it? You know, <laughs> yeah. it, 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 it? He can't help himself. You know they're going to feed, and then when them them catfish do the same thing, and sometimes I mean sometimes in big blues, I mean there might be a a five, six, eight pound carp swim by and they'll eat it. So, I mean, that it's crazy, but their weights can fluctuate a lot. Well, yeah. you, you say that. So what's the, what size bait do you use to catch a giant blue cat? Well, I caught about a two inch by two inch chunk is what I caught my PB on. Okay. So it was cut so bait. I, it was cut bait. It was, it was actually a cut piece of moon eye or two tearing you know, it's got a bunch of different names people call it, but it's basically, it's just a, just a herring. Um, but just a body section, about two inches by two inches. And uh, and I was drifting, you know, when I caught it, just covering water. Do you use any live bait? I do. I'll, I'll use live bait. And honestly, I have better luck with cut bait than I do live bait. Okay. And I've caught some big flatheads. We put a, we put a 47 pound flathead in the boat. Uh, this summer, I think it was August, and uh, we caught it on a piece of cut bait. Huh. You know, in a in a brush pile on the edge of the channel that we had been catching blues out of. We caught a, 
a 42 pound blue and a 36 pound blue the same day that we caught that 47 pound flathead. And that was all on cut bait. Okay. My, my, my PB on live bait right now on the river is uh, 35 pounds. Okay. And so that was on a, uh, about an eight inch live moon eye. Okay. So okay. I don't, I don't know. I mean, you would think the live bait would work awesome because that's that's what they're after. That that's what they're eating. I don't know if the cut bait. I mean, I know it, it gives off different scent, and and maybe it gives off the the scent of uh, of injured or wounded bait fish, you know, because it's got the blood in, in it too. But I have much better luck on cut than I do live, honestly. Kind of that feeding frenzy deal that you're talking yeah. about. I mean, you get. You, you ever, if you've ever, and I experienced this bass fishing, and it's typically this time of the year when the shad are out in the middle and they start blowing up on Chad, and you'll get up to a, a spot where they had just got done feeding, and you'll see scales and, sh and you almost see like a you sheen. Oil. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say yeah. oil sheen across the it's water. It's like a crime scene. Uh, and there's stuff floating in the water, and it, it, it what you just said, a crime scene just happened. Uh, Absolutely. I would imagine that's the same thing. You take a cut bait. Do you chum for them too as well? No, I don't, I don't chum. Um, I don't, I mean, it's hard to chum for them too. I mean, the river, it's got the current, it's constantly moving. Right. Um, and it's, in my opinion, it's not necessary. You know, you can, uh, you can cover a lot of water and, and these fish, these fish have a, they have a nose. I mean, it's like a white-tailed deer. Um, you you mark them, you know, like like typically we'll scan for the fish. We'll mark hopefully a school of them. But a lot of times, I mean, they're, they're no different than any other fish, even in the river. They love they love the structure, and they'll hold to it. I don't care if it's in the in, in the middle of the channel in 35, 40 foot of water. If you got structure, they're going to hang to it. So. Um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll fish them deep into the structure, but when we mark them like that, we'll mark them, we'll go upstream and set our baits above the structure. And those fish sent, they, they sent trail that bait right to it. I mean, it sometimes might take them 15 minutes, but if they, if they hit that scent trail, they're, they'll come right and find it. And I mean, it's, it's game on. So, I mean, that's an important part of setting up on the fish is, I mean, locating them is important, but then you got to know how far above the fish to go to set up on them. You know, if you, uh, if you mark the fish and say you're in 40 foot of water and you go above those fish, um, 50 feet and you got a mile and a half current, you didn't go far enough. If you cast your baits out at all, by the time they drop, because the current's pulling them away from you the whole time, by the time they hit the bottom, you're behind those fish. Mm. So you got to move far enough ahead of them. And, and you can even go extra far ahead of them. And you can walk the baits back if you're not getting any bites and walk them closer to the brush. But if you set up too close to them and your baits are behind them, they'll never scent trail it because the scent's blowing out behind them with the current. So you, it's, I mean, there's a science to, to the catfish and just like everything else. And when you figure it out, I mean, you start catching a lot more fish and uh, uh, you'll learn quick, you know, from, from then on, definitely how to set up. And in shallower water or less current, you don't have to go as far above them. I mean, you'll figure it out. You just have to keep playing with it and you'll figure it out by catching more fish. It sounds like when we're trout fishing, you know, you got to catch the right seam and, and get your bait basically in front of them. Current seams are everything too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you got to be able to read the river and know how it's how your your rig is going to to bounce to them or get to them, and so it doesn't swing out in the middle of the channel where you got no fish and your brush piles sixty feet that way. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, it's. I, I've I've watched a blue cat hunt my bait on the live scope, and you want to talk about an extremely impressive display. That's one thing I wish I would have had videoed on my screen just watching it and it, it was a 40 pounder and I was on a brush pile and I was live scoping and I dropped my bait and walked it back to him. And at the, my bait was about 15 feet 
behind the transducer. I'm in about 22 foot of water. And I had my screen set on 40 feet. So I can see 30 feet behind, 25 feet behind my bait. And I saw the fish swim across the screen sideways. And when he crossed the scent trail, the bait, he did a 180. He spun around, reacted like a, like a crappie would react or a bass would react to your bait when it first sees it on the live scope. You'll, you'll get that initial reaction. That's how this fish reacted 25 feet behind the bait. And he swam out of the screen and then came back in the back of the screen, went down to the bottom, came straight up, eased up, bellied up onto the log and swam straight to the bait and then hammered it. It was, oh, wow. it was one of the coolest, it was one of the coolest yeah. displays. I mean, I got to watch that fish from start to finish, hit the scent trail, verify what it was and then hunt it down and attack it. And it was, it was impressive. I had a buddy of mine in the boat with me and, and, and I was just, I was like the commentator. I was telling my buddy, I'm like, look at this. He just <laughs> hit the scent trail, watch him. So look at him come to lock. He's hunting it. And he just, he creamed it. And I mean, I was in awe. My rod was bent over and I'm still just staring at the screen, <laughs> you know, because it was impressive. I mean, they're no different, you know, than, than, than any of your other game fish, really. I mean, they, they have learned to adapt to, to their surroundings. And I mean, that heavy current, the, the muddy water, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, they rely on their senses and, and they're, they're pretty good at it. What, how much have you learned since you've got live scope for catfishing, right? Like live scope came out and, and my first thought, I'm sure your first thought was, oh yeah, it's great for crappie fishermen. Like you can sit on I use it for everything and, and drop down, but I, and when Gabe talked to me about you and using live scope on the river, it's like, wait, what? And then I got to talking to some of my other buddies who were cat fishermen on the river. That yeah, that's they lay live scope for blue cats. And it's like I love really? it. I watched I watched my PB swim up to the bait and hammer it. So is your transducer fixed or do you have it on a turret? No, oh, I, I have it on a pole. That I made myself. I I got a little. I mean, I got a little different setup. I have two two live scopes on the boat, and one one I I use mainly for for catfishing and stuff. And the way I have it set up, I mean, I can set up on brush piles, drop in brush piles, and almost catch them out of there like crappie. Especially when the current's low, like like it has been this summer. The water level's low. They're not letting a lot of water through the dam, so we don't have a lot of current. So it makes it easier. You know, I have to make adjustments when I'm fishing in the current, but, uh, and it's, it's pretty cool to watch those fish, you know, just do their thing, you know, and come and hunt it and attack it. And I mean, I, I watched my 80 pounder swim up and, and eat the bait right in front of me, you know, and it was, it was awesome. So I'm imagining, is that transducer off the back then? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you're anchored up, just trying to. Pick not, I, I I don't anchor up. Okay, so you're on. You have your spot lock on. I'll spot lock, or I'm drifting. Okay. And then you're, you got your, your. My boat faces into the current. Yep, and your forward facing's out the back. Yep. And you can pan it around and and watch your bait and watch around your bait. Yep. I That's haven't, awesome. I haven't said a lot about about this. I've been doing this for a couple of years on them. I ha I haven't said a lot about that part of the catfishing, but it's it's changed. I mean, it's changed everything for me, you know. But I mean, I got really good with the live scope on the crappie, the largemouth white bass, hybrid stripers. I got good with it on everything else, and then just incorporated it into our our river fishing too. Right. So I mean, it took a little bit. You know, it's it's tricky. I'm not going to say you're going to run right out there you know, and start live, live scope and blue cat. It's, it's, it's tricky, but it is doable. Here's a question from Stephanie. Um, what is the difference between a channel cat and a mud cat? Uh, terminology and what most people say, but uh, a mud cat 
what a lot of people in our area would call a mud cat is actually a bullhead. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Uh, or a, they call it a yellow belly, mm -hmm. and it's it's just a different a different type of catfish. I mean, they're I think they're all you know similar family, but I mean it's it's just a different type, and they well, don't get as big. I would say those don't grow very big. I've caught numerous of those, and every one of them that's caught eight, nine, ten inches long. Yeah, most of them are small. Yeah. Uh, some of the there's like there I, there's about three different strains even of the bullhead. There's a yellow bullhead, a brown bullhead, I think a black bullhead, and I think I think some of them um, five six pounds maybe it's like a like a record on them maybe eight pounds okay. something like that. But I mean, so for that to be the record, then yeah, they don't get very big. Yeah, I've caught one probably four pounds, and it was, it was out of the river, and, that, and that's a really that's a really big one. Like that's like you said, that's, yeah, yeah, a really big one. Yeah, yeah, it, and they really big head, huge they head, have a thin thinned out body. They just if a funny it, looking fish. If it, had <laughs> four, if it was four pounds, two and a half at least was its head. <laughs> yeah, like a pit bull almost. We yeah. had a we had a little when I was in college. I lived up in Creevecourt, and there was a little subdivision lake i guess in our apartment complex whatever you want to call it and of course you know being a fish fish head and fish bomb like i had my equipment up there so i knew i could just run down the stairs and go fish between classes or whatever and i'd go down there and fish and i'd have people looking at me like what in the world is this, this old redneck doing out here well there wasn't anything in there but a bunch of yellow belly catfish that was in that little pond yeah or they would hit a speed crawl like nobody's business. You flip it out <laughs> underneath a, a lay down and they just whack. But Absolutely. they were all, you know, eight to 12, 13 yeah. inches. They weren't ever yep. any big. Yep. So, but uh, Todd asks, um, what is your favorite catfish to eat and what is the best size to eat? My favorite catfish is definitely the blue cat. Uh, the flathead's good too, but my personal preference is the blue. Um, the blue cat, if you prep it up right and you cut all the red and, you know, just get it down to the, to the white meat. I hate to even say it, but it doesn't hardly matter what size it is. It tastes good. Really? Um, yeah, but I mean, they say, you know, of course you hear all kinds of things. They say the bigger fish been in the river a long time, might have mercury in them or might have this or that in them. So, I mean, ideally, yeah, I mean, eat the five pounders, you know, and you're going to be the safest if they are exposed to anything. But they're definitely going to be delicious. Now, do you do you filter your catfish out with clean water after they've been in the river, or no. just go ahead and eat them right out of the river? I do. Um, whenever I keep, uh, which I don't keep a lot of blue cat, but I do like it, and and my buddies at work like it, so we'll have a couple fish fries, you know. Um, so. I'll catch mine out of the cold water. I prefer all my fish out of cold water. Uh, so wintertime fish, in my opinion, they taste better. Uh, whether it be crappie, catfish, it doesn't matter. To me, the cold water fish tastes better. So um, those are what I call my freezer fish. There's a, those are the fish I want to bring home out of the cold water. Uh, so most, most of the other times, um, you know, I'll be catching limits. Most of the time I throw them back. Uh, just fun fish, you know, because I don't I don't like to eat the fish out of the hot water. And again, that's personal preference, but I taste the difference. I, I think the meat isn't as flaky and as it's it's almost like it's mushy. Mushier. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I could see that. And to me, I mean it tastes fishier. Um, right. and I know the cold water, you know, if you if you catch them January, February, early March, if you're catching your fish then for the freezer. You know, you've had that cold water for months now. I, I think a lot of the parasites, ha, you know, are dead. And uh, a lot of the, you know, the nasty stuff in the water, you know, is it's dead, you know. And I just think the fish are, are cleaner, you know, mm -hmm. which, again, is is just I ain't got no facts to back that up. That's just <laughs> that makes my, sense. It's my opinion, but it definitely I can taste the difference. And whenever I I show my buddies or do comparisons with my buddies. I mean, they, they can, they agree. They taste the difference too. I mean, so at personal preference, but that's, that's just how I do. Well, there's a lot of meat that you get off of a, a 20 to 40 pound blue cat. 
Oh, you could. Um, I definitely recommend throwing those back, but but you can eat. You could eat them, yeah. and you can get a, a bunch of meat off of them. Um, even a even a five to ten pound one, you're getting a lot of meat oh, off yeah. of one. And and that's that's what we try to do is if we want eaters, we try to we try to eat fish ten pounds and under. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, once you get a, a fish, and it doesn't matter what it is, but we're talking about blues right now. So once you get a blue cat up to 10, 15 pound range, the size of food it can eat has greatly increased. Therefore, the growth rate of that fish greatly increases. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking some of these fish, like a hundred pound fish, people think that's a hundred years old. I think that fish is 20 years old. So, I mean, once they get up there and hit that certain size, especially like a 20 pound fish, that fish's growth rate has, is seriously increasing every year because it's eating bigger, bigger food. It needs more food to sustain itself. So it's feeding more. I mean, it's, it's going to grow fast. Yeah. If it's eating, if it's eating, a take a, take a 60 pound fish and it's able to eat a five to six pound carp, no problem once or twice a day or just 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 say once a day i don't i don't know how often they feed but it, you, you it, can it'll just, be close to that to sustain itself yeah so you can see you just start doing the math and it's just it, it's it quantifies it's going to continue to grow bigger yeah. and faster because it can put bigger stuff in its mouth. well and they're opportunistic feeders too right they're not i'll tell you what i used to really believe that until i started live scoping them really they're they're predators huh? i think th i think I think the blue cat are some of the pickiest fish I've ever fished for. <laughs> it I'm sounds personal. I, I honestly, I'm not kidding. I think, I think sometimes they are the pickiest. Um, I mean, they have three, four, you know, maybe um, they got a lot of different food to eat, but they got a handful that is readily available to them all the time. And that's mm -hmm. a carp, that's shad, uh, the moon eye and the skipjack in our area, they got a good part of the year. Now, like when the cold water's getting here, we're coming up on the, on the, there's going to be a big shad die off this winter. It's a shad bite. I mean, you just use shad because there's an abundance. It's easy for them and they're going to be able to gorge and feed up right before winter on them. So we use shad, we catch the crap out of them, but there's certain times when skipjack it's it's a skipjack bite and they'll and it's even weird they'll even go a step further it'll be skipjack heads now how the heck do they determine the difference <laughs> between the head and the body but they do i mean you could have two guys side by side in the boat back bouncing or bumping and one guy can be using body chunks and the other guy using heads and that guy using heads sometimes might catch every fish of the day he might catch 10 12 fish and the guy using body pieces never caught a fish huh. i don't i mean i don't understand it and i've watched them swim up and put their nose right on a live moon eye uh, a live skipjack a live asian carp and swim away from it and i've watched them i mean one one instance me and my buddy we dropped a um, about an eight inch live asian carp down in front of the fish he swam up to it and swam off. I'm like, you can't say no to that. I mean, it's perfect size. It's alive. I can see it swimming in your face. So I pulled it up. <laughs> I cut the tail off where now it's bleeding, but it's still flipping around because it's alive. Dropped it back down, but now it's injured. I'm like, okay, predatory instinct kicks in. You're eating him now. Swam off. So I had my buddy with me and I told him, I said, pull it up. I cut the head off, cut the rest of the tail off, drop the center section of the body back down and watch the fish come up and eat it. Instantly? Wow. Yeah. Makes zero sense to me. Wow. Zero sense. Well, that's so, what, that's why we're that's why we're fishermen and we, well, that's we buy same, that fishing that's license, a, not that catching license. <laughs> yeah. That's the same thing with with uh bass can be like that too. I mean, I guess it's it's just a fish thing. In any species of fish is going to be well, even crappie you know, there's some days where you can put any piece of plastic on there you want. You know, you can just buy something from Bobby Garland, put it on a 16 or 8 ounce jig head, throw it out there and you're going to slam. There's some times where 
you got to go to a 16th ounce jig head. You got to go to a 32nd ounce jig head. And then there's sometimes when they want funky chicken, they don't want nothing else. They want something with pink in it. There's sometimes when they want black and chartreuse. It's, it's crazy. I mean, you go through like six or seven different colors and you'll finally find one that they want. Um, you you yeah. see that all the time with bass fishing. If you're, if you're out there live scoping, they want a certain bait. Yep. over everything else and it, and you got to be patient enough to go through all those or you're not you do fish and, and a big a big thing that's frustrating with the live scope that most people don't understand i never understood it uh and i my my fishing background started hardcore bass fishing and i had when i started live scoping for bass i had no idea how many fish actually followed my bait that never hit it yeah you get so many follows it's insane and, and I'm thinking, oh, there ain't no fit, man, the fish ain't biting there. There ain't no fish here today. And on the live scope, I'm watching all these fish follow it up. And it's crazy. It's like, holy crap, man. I mean, you're in them, but something is not quite right. Your presentation's off a little bit. Your color's off a little bit. I mean, something's off a little bit. And if you can figure that out, those follows, they, they turn into strikes. Right. Well, I mean, how many times have you been crappy fishing with live scope? Or before live scope, when you're, you're fishing a brush pile, you saw them on there, and they moved, or or we caught them all. You didn't catch them all. Not even close. So you, you caught, you just, you caught, you, you caught a bunch. You educated the rest. Yeah, yeah exactly. And now now they and, won't bite again. And so. what we what we always did before the live scope, I mean, we'd scan for the brush piles. We'd find them. We'd throw the marker buoy out. We'd circle around. We'd jig around, get snagged up or whatever, throw another marker buoy. But typically we drop to the bottom, come up a foot, come up a foot, come up a foot. And we'd go to the bottom, work our way up and catch our fish. Right. 100% opposite of what I do now. Right. You catch a lot more fish if you start at the top of the pile and work your way down. When you start at the bottom of the pile, you're spooking a bunch of those fish. Yep. So you educate so them as they go up. You do. You educate them. So you, you catch a few fish, the rest of them shut down. They're like, the gig's up. I see what's going on. I'm not falling for that. Right. If you start at the top of the pile and work your way down and fish the edges of it, you'll catch a lot more fish off that pile. So the live scope is a very effective tool in learning not only the behavior of the fish, but how they react to your baits. And, and it cuts your time down, uh, figuring out how to catch those fish. I, I I can pull up to a pile, um, standing tree, say, and this is how I describe it to my buddies. If I pull up to the tree and the crappie are the leaves on the tree, okay? If it looks like there's a bunch of leaves on the tree, it's full of crappie, but it looks like it's a very calm day, none of the fish are moving. They're all sitting still. Nothing's moving. It's going to be a tough bite. Now, if you pull up to that tree and all them, all the leaves on it, the crappie on it, are it looks like it's a windy day. They're all moving all over the place and they're really active. You're going to wreck them. Mm -hmm. So I can pull up and, and once you use the scope enough, you can pull up to a pile and even know if, well, that's a bunch of eight, nine, you know, inch fish, short fish, you know, so you don't even have to fish it. If, if they're not moving, if you know it's going to be tough, you can move on. You don't have to waste the time fishing it. So uh, it, it's a valuable tool. And the, and the way, like, I use it to uh, narrow down my size, narrow down my colors. If I, if I drop a bait in there, and the crappie almost always will react a little bit to your bait when they see it. If I'm not getting much of a reaction, I'm totally off what they want to eat. Whether I'll change, um, I'll change sizes. I'll change from plastics to hair jigs, and even colors. I I need a I need a solid reaction, and I know when I get a solid reaction, I'm on the right track. When I then if I start to get short strikes, then it's it's like a puzzle. You're putting the pieces together, but I know okay, I'm getting closer, and then then you're going to get to the thump, and when it's thumping, you you've nailed it. You put it together. And you've nailed it. See what you just said though, though proves that just because you have live scope doesn't mean you're loading the boat with fish. You still no. got to put the puzzle together. It's just a piece oh. that helps us put that puzzle together. It's a valuable tool. Yep. But everybody, I, I have the debate all the time. Oh, you're a live scoper. You're cheating. Well, hey, I've been fishing all my life, and I've 
I've got a ton of of pictures pre live scope. I mean, I caught 35 bass in Illinois over seven pounds before the live scope. My PB is a 1015 in Illinois. I have four more over nine pounds. I mean, that was no live scope. I put the time in. Uh, the live scope's a valuable tool, but there's not one button anywhere on it that makes those fish bite. Believe me, I looked. It's not there. <laughs> And there's nothing more frustrating than pulling up on a pile with a hundred crappie and not being able to pull one off of it. Right. So it's uh it, it's it's an amazing tool. It's one of the funnest things I've ever used, but on some days it's the most frustrating as well. well. And what you said about the live scope, like it's not just it's all those things that we thought five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago that we were that our our dad and our granddad taught us that we spent all these hours out there learning like you might as well throw much of that in the trash can yeah because most of it's not true that that you need to set, have a jerk well, set for 15 seconds in the winter yeah just to get one to come up and buy no you're just in the wrong area yep so we're just seeing the reasons why those things aren't working or, or are working yeah we're, we, we're we, we had just we had those theories yeah in our head this was what was going on but a lot of times that's not exactly what was going on. It was right. something completely different. And, yeah. and, and the amount of fish that are in a body of water is mind boggling. Well, and, There's fish everywhere. And what Eric there said, is. how many fish There's, are following your bait that you didn't have a clue? That's it. Yeah. That's it. You, you know. don't know. I have, I have a friend. He's a, a fisheries biologist in Illinois. And he's not a live scoper. He's been in the boat a couple times with us live scoping. And, and he even told me. It, it debunked a lot of the theories that they had on fish behavior. But you can't, you can't take a fish out of its natural habitat, throw it in the tank, and study it and think you know its behavior because you don't. You don't know anything's behavior if it's not in its natural environment. So it's tough to study these fish, you know, legitimately. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, the, the live scope, I mean, it, it's a no-brainer. I mean, it shows you right now, real time, what's going on and what those fish are doing. And and it just, like I said, it's a valuable tool. It, it, it helps you be more efficient on the water. Um, would I be mad if they outlawed it during tournaments? I don't care. I mean, it's a level playing field if everybody has one. I mean, or take it away. I, it, it doesn't matter to me either way. But, I mean, I, I think it's a very valuable tool. I haven't seen – it's been out long enough now. A lot of guys say it's going to ruin fishing. It's going to – there's not going to be any more fish. I have not seen a decline in any of the lakes I fish. And the lakes I fish are pressured regular. I mean, there's, there's guys on the water all the time. Carlisle's fishing as good as it ever has since I've been fishing it. And, I mean – that lake, that lake is, I mean, it gets hammered, but it's, it's just an amazing fishery. What, what kind of lake is that? I've, I've, I've never been there. Is it a lake that's got standing timbers? It got a lot of rock. Is it it's got, got contour changes or what's it set up like? It's got a Kaskaskia river runs through it. It's a, okay. A flood control lake uh, is what it is. And Kaskaskia river runs through it. So, I mean, it, it has a legit, uh, legit river, you know, and river channel through it. It's got a ton of riprap and big chunk rock around a good bit of it. Um, the biologists that managed it and the core engineers, they have done an excellent job uh, putting uh, structures and man-made structures, Christmas trees, diff, you know, wood in it uh, for bank fishermen as well as boat fishermen. I mean, you there's so many areas there you can go and fish off the bank and be in just as good a structure as any guy in a boat. So, I mean, they've done a great job. There is one area that has a lot of submerged standing timber. Um, and it, and it's, it's pretty good, you know, a lot of times of the year, not all the time. But, um, I mean, it's got a little bit of everything. But they've put so much stuff in that lake that it's just, I mean, it's phenomenal. It's, it's, it's a flood control lake, but, man, they did a good job building it for the fishermen, too. What, what's the what's the water color like, you know, on, on average? 
the typical watercolor. I know it's going to vary at times, but it, it does. Um, like this year, we haven't had a lot of rain, so we haven't had a lot of flow through the river. So the clarity has been really decent for, for Carlisle, but most of the time, if you got 12 inches of visibility, that's a lot. Oh, okay. So I mean, it's, it's, really it's, it's, it's got, it's not chocolate, but it's got a pretty good stain to it. Okay. But it's, I mean, it's better than that right now, you know, but like I said, we haven't had a lot of rain and uh, they try to maintain, you know, a certain river pool or I mean a winter pool of the lake, you know, mm -hmm. with the dam and stuff. So, so it's, I mean, it's, it's got pretty decent clarity. Is it, um, what is the, like the acreage of the lake? And then would you say, I'm, is there like a, a section that fishes better than another section or is it just kind of whatever? Just got to get out there and figure it out. I, I think it's 21,000 acres. I, it's, it's the biggest man-made lake in the state. Um, I know there's an area that's, that's north of the trussel the train trussel on the, on the North end of the lake, there's a train trussel that cuts across the lake. Okay. It's very dangerous on the North end of that trussel. It's shallow and it's full of submerged stumps all over the place. There's been many a boat, uh, lose the lower units up on. It that sounds area. like Ren Lake, you know, Ren Lake, you get up in that North mm -hmm. section on Ren Lake and it's really yep. dangerous too. I don't go North of the trussel ever. Okay. So, I mean, I, I do a lot of fishing there. I've never go north of the trust. Is that from Keysport to Boulder? No, Keysport to Boulder is really good. The Keysport and Boulder are both just south of the trestle. North of that trestle right there, it's There's a bunch of islands out there. Yep. It's very shallow. It's very stumpy. I mean, the river channel does run through there. But you better know that place if you're going to navigate it. God forbid you guys have a north or south wind. Oh, it it legit gets rough. Oh, I would imagine so. It's big, wide open. There's not much out there, it looks like. It's, Tom says it's it's rough. Cool. Water's not above 444. Don't try and go above the trestle. Oh, he's absolutely right. And it, right now it's 444.80. Hmm. So, yeah, don't. Uh, I leave that that part for the duck hunters and, and for the guys that know know that area. I'm I'm not going in it. There's too much of the lake that you, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to go up there. There's too much good fishing. Right. And what I do is there's ramps all around the lake. So I look at the wind direction and let that determine the area of the lake I'm going to fish. There's enough ramps around the lake and enough coves and cuts and, and um, angles of banks, you know, to get you out of the wind, no matter what direction it's in. So, I mean, the lake does get very rough. It is dangerous. If you try to cross this lake with a, a big North or, or South wind, I mean, it's going to be rough. I mean, there's, there's been quite a few boats that are on the bottom of that lake right now. Hmm. Um, I mean, it, it will, it'll sink you. Is but, there a, is, is that river channel that runs through there? Is it, is it wind around where you got river ledges and things like that? Absolutely. Okay. So it's not just a straight shot like a Kentucky nope. Lake where it just hammers nope. down through it. Okay, nope. cool. And I mean, the uh, they've just started stocking blues in there. I believe last year, or the year before, maybe twenty one, they started stocking the blue cat. It's a phenomenal channel cat fishery. Uh, drifting flats uh, along the river channel and stuff works really well. Um, dragging baits, drifting, uh, anchoring off. I mean the guys do every kind of they jug fish it i mean they do every kind of fishing you can but i mean i catch a bunch of channel cat even crappie fishing there it's got it's got a very healthy population of nice channel cat i got you you said earlier you mentioned you fish down at watch tall right yep and it's a very deep lake what's the deepest that you've caught a catfish uh we didn't catch anything deep there, there was a there was a massive thermal climb at forty feet at Washita. Okay. So, which I mean, when you when you get to reading your sonar, and I mean, you can you you can see that thermal climb, and you know what you're looking at. You can eliminate a lot of a lot of water. You don't have to mess with. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, the deepest I've caught them's been been in the river, and 
um, we, we catch them, you know, 50, 60 foot deep. And in my area, that's, I mean, there's a few holes that are deeper than that, but that's the majority of, that's the deepest I get. Okay. So, but I mean, we'll catch them there, but the rivers are different than the lakes. You know, I mean, it's constantly turning. There's no thermal climb. The temperature of the water, I'm not going to say is, is the same top to bottom, but it's a lot, a lot closer than lakes because of the constant stirring of the water and the oxygen level is really good, you Mm -hmm. know? So it don't bother those fish to go to the bottom in, in 60, 70 foot of water or, I catch them sometimes in in 50 foot of water, 20 foot deep, suspended. Hmm. Uh, the, I mean, the, the blues will suspend quite a bit a certain time of year. Even out and, in the current? Yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll drift fish. And again, that's where your electronics, that's where the live scope comes in. I don't, I'm not going to drop my stuff to the bottom and come up just a little bit, you know, so I'm not going to fish 45 foot deep and 50 foot of water when my fish are 20, 25 feet. Yeah, I'm going to drop my baits 25 feet and I'm going to drift through them and I'm going to put fish in the boat. That's awesome. It's, yeah. It's, I mean, and again, that's, that's the, that's the electronics and, and that's the, the live scope being able to see the difference between, you know, what are catfish and what ain't. Out of the catfish species, who's the best fighter? Mm, the, a flathead probably fights better. Yeah. yeah. We can, we can almost always tell when we have a flathead, um, they, they are just powerful. Is it I pound mean, for pound or does like a 30 or 40 pound flathead blow out a, an 80 pound blue? No, it's not, it's not quite like that, but a 40 pound flathead, you'll, you'll swear you got a 60 pound blue. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah. It's that fish. They, I mean, the, the, I think a lot of it's even in their head, you know, I mean, the, the way that fish is designed and that, that long body and that big, big tail fin, those jokers, man, they fight. They, they fight different, though. We almost always know when we got a big flathead on because they just fight a little different. But, I mean, they're powerful. Yeah. And, yeah, and not to take anything away from the big blues, but it just, I mean, they just, they do fight a little better. Does a 40 or 50 pound blue fight better than a, a big 80 pound blue or is it pound for pound? They're it's, just dogs. It, they it's, just fight. it's funny. It's individual fish basis. It's okay. I've caught me and my buddy was, was just talking about this not too long ago. Uh, I've caught 35 pound fish that fought harder than, than some of my biggest fish I've ever caught. They're just, they're just a mean, angry fish. I guess they got a bad attitude. I guess they just fight hard. I mean, from the time you hook them, Till the time you get them out of the boat, throwed back, they they go nuts in the boat. It's like, I don't. It's like the fish is crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's really, it's just, yeah. he's got his own personality. It's yeah. it's funny, but it, it's it's true. It's true. You'll get occasional just outright mean fish, and I, I mean, you'll swear he's bigger than he is, and and then you think, well, I'm glad you wasn't a hundred pounder. I probably never got you in the boat. He suck. He would suck my boat probably. Right. Yeah. So, it's. I mean, that's individual fish basis. You so know, you like, spent a lot of time on the Mississippi River. Uh, quite a bit, yeah. What's the what's the craziest thing that you've caught on the Mississippi River or seen? Because I, I, there's always the stories about, you know, the, the bull sharks that have made it up there. And, I've never seen nothing like that. Uh, but we have caught – well, uh, one day we were out hybrid fishing, uh, white bass and hybrid fishing in Mississippi – and we caught 10 different species of fish in one day, all, all on, on crankbaits. Right. Um, but I've caught, uh, we've caught eel on rod and reel out there. That's yeah. a creepy fish. Yeah, that's, that's a very that's creepy a, fish. Th- those are creepy. Um, uh, I've caught grass carp, buffalo, and Asian carp in the mouth on a crankbait. Huh. So, I mean, the, yeah. it's like the gloves are off in the river like right. i don't think there's anything out there that won't actually eat a shad even even a grass carp or whatever i mean i that's the only thing i can think is why they would eat that crankbait mm-hmm. and most of the flatheads i catch on the river i catch on a crankbait fishing for whites and hybrids 
Wow. I mean, they, they got the same the same haunts, I guess. They love the rocks, you know. What's your biggest hybrid? Uh, my biggest hybrid out there, personally, is 10 and a half. Okay. Um, we have caught, my buddy caught um, a 13-pound pure striper on the Mississippi. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we catch the occasional pure striper. Wow. It's like a unicorn almost. Yeah. Um, caught smallmouth bass at in, in Alton in the Mississippi. Really? Yeah. Huh. First, first, and, only, first and only smallmouth I ever caught right there. And huh. I've heard of I've heard of northern pike. I've never caught one, but I heard a couple different different people talk about uh yep, sturgeon. We we catch a lot of sturgeon. Um, but I've I've heard of northern pike. I haven't personally done that one. Walleye. Um, I've caught moon eye skipjack on crankbaits out there. Um, it, I mean, just about everything. Hmm. Uh, sucker fish, paddlefish. Oh, yeah. I mean, usually we, we don't catch, we have not caught one of them in the mouth, but foul so hooked them or snagging, you know, we've caught them. Right. And those, those are cool on the live scope. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's no mistaking that's what they are. But it's there's so many different fish in the river, and so much of the fishery is is untouched out there. Well, and I'm sure you've probably hooked and lost multiple fish that are bigger than what you got. Yeah, I learned a few valuable lessons the hard way, um, but. That's what makes you a better fisherman. Oh, know? absolutely. Absolutely. We we've we've lost some really big fish. Um, I won't say I've lost a hundred pounder. I don't know I've ever hooked into a hundred pounder. I've lost some some very big fish. Um I'm confident I seen one well over a hundred on the live scope. Just judging from some of the the sixties to eighties that we've caught, um, what they look like. I've seen some legit fish out there huh. um tricking them into biting sometimes is tough but yeah that seems like it'd be like reeling in a, in a volkswagen it's uh, it's weird like i said again it's it's individual fish basis i mean i caught i caught my 80 i was in the boat by myself that day i had to net that fish but from the time now i have the gear for those fish so by the time that fish hit to the time I put that fish in the boat in the net was about five minutes. And that was me by myself. Dang, that's impressive. Had I had a, a partner with me, I, we could have did it a little quicker. The net job was a little tricky <laughs> and, and getting them into the boat. But but it it's not the gear they have now, like like Bluff City, they got they have such a variety of, of heavy gear design. For these hundred pound fish honestly these days if you set your stuff up right those hundred pound fish getting them hooks the hard part they don't have a chance after that almost mm -hmm. you know as long as you have everything set up right i mean so talk uh, a little bit about that what is your setup on on that uh on mine i run um i run primarily um canine line i'm on the canine pro staff and they got a uh, they got some Canine cat line. It's it's heavy duty braid. I run a hundred pound braid to uh, eighty pound mono leader, and um, we run. Did mainly my majority of my use is it's similar to like a Carolina rig. Mm -hmm. uh, I use a slide weight setup, and then uh, uh, just a like a three foot. Uh, my leader leader links always vary but but uh just run a liter mono liter off of that 80 pound and uh, i don't a lot of guys crimp their stuff i don't i'm i'm still old school you know hand tying everything um but it's it's pretty it's really i mean we used to we used to be like a lot more crazy about our stuff really and i've i've went back to the less is more you know I don't, I don't, for the most part, run three-way swivels and stuff anymore. Um, 
I do have like a double hook rig that I, that I'll tie for drift fishing or something like that. But I mean, I just, uh, we run like, like mad cats. Um, I use some mad cats rods, some, uh, rip and lip HD series rods. I mean, we got a bunch of different rods. The, the rods are most, for the most part, they're all quality rods these days. I mean, they all got a heavy blank. The fish aren't going to break them. I mean, the, 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 the tangling with catfish TWC rods. I mean, you can't hardly break these rods. I mean, they're just, they got it down to a science. They're designed to handle these heavy fish. And it's just, and the lines, the the braids and stuff. I mean, they have every, all this stuff's down to a science anymore. I mean, it's, it's pretty legit. So they have all that stuff you just talked about, a lot of that over at uh, Bluff City Outdoors. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, and, yeah. and people that are on here, if you don't know about Bluff City Outdoors and you're in the Alton area, go by there and check out that place. I know um, Marfell has been trying to get some of the bass fishing gear built up in there, but it's. Uh, it's on its way. It's on its way. We're working yeah. on it and it's on its way. They got a phenomenal crappie selection, phenomenal catfish selection. And I, I mean, I don't care if you want to go channel cat fishing uh, to flathead and blue cat all the way to snagging for spoonbills. They got the setup. They got the lines. They got the rods. I mean, the hooks they had, they got everything in there. And I mean, now he's got that big archery center in there too. I mean, he's got a lot going on. Yeah, that's pretty. And cool. he's got the best, the best crappie selection. I mean, he he's got phenomenal crappie selection, and yeah, I, I love it. I, I don't have a problem going in there and getting the things I need. You know. Yeah, I want to get. I want to make a road trip up there and just check out the place. I like that. That indoor archery stuff is pretty cool. That's it that's, is. It, it's it's, it's real in. cool. He's got he's got a lot going on. You know, under the roof of that place, there's. I mean, live bait, frozen bait. I mean, they're always, I mean, he's got a big trapping supply. I mean, he's, he's catering, he's catering to the outdoorsman in there. I mean, he's, he's got an impressive shop for the area. For and he's sure. got guy. he's got a guide, guides or two that could, you know, if somebody wanted to uh, yep, you, go you, in there and go in and get set up, he'll, he'll get right. you set up with a guy. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And it's, so, uh, um, as far as like, um, if, if somebody that's, I don't know, maybe just wanting to get into catfishing and stuff, what's, um, what kind of price point are they going to expect to spend on, on something that's, that's decent? I know not talking top of the line, but you don't want junk either, you know, cause you can get a phenomenal catfish rod for a hundred dollars. Okay. Okay. That's, I mean, that's very reasonable. Yeah. That's, that's very reasonable. The deal is there's a bunch of companies making a quality product. So they're all competing. So the price point's pretty good. Um, I mean, a hundred dollar rod. I, I mean, you, you can get a heck of a rod for a hundred dollar bill. What about a reel? What's it? What's a good, uh, the real is, level reel? well, bait I cast mean, or spinning rod or spinning reel. I'm, I'm all, all bait cast. Okay. I mean, to me, performance wise they're pretty good and and i'm a i'm a big uh um shimano guy you know i like the the takota 500s and and 400s they're they're really good reels and they handle they handle big fish um but i mean the pins um akumas i mean he's got there he's got a, he's got a huge selection of reels in there too the reels is all in how much money you want to spend he's mm -hmm. got right he's got He's got pretty decent hundred dollar reels to to four or five hundred dollar reels. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's and and to me, I mean, a hundred dollar rod is a really good really good price for a quality rod to me. But I won't hesitate to put a three hundred dollar reel on that rod just because I know the performance I'm getting. Yeah. I know, I know the guts of that reel is doing the work on that hundred pound fish. Yeah. I mean, the rod's got a lot to do with it, but that reel's doing the work. You gotta have a good drag, right? I mean, you gotta have, you gotta have a good drag. And like I said, you want, you want a good, a good braided line and, uh, you know, a good knots. But like, like I said, I'm, I'm back to the less is more type of thing. And it, and I've been doing this with, with my deer hunting, with other kinds of fishing, 
um, and I've been having great success, you know, kind of backing off instead of having three knots on one line, you know, I got one knot or two knots, you know, or, you know, minimize all the, the room for error, you know, you know, I don't want, I don't want a bunch of spots that can fail, you know, so I, I go back with the less is more. And like on the Carolina rig, you know, I just run a, a barrel swivel. So I'll run my main line down to a barrel swivel, but I'll put another barrel swivel. I'll run my main line just straight through one of the eyes. So it, it free floats up my line. And then I'll run, I'll, I'll run different lengths on some. I'll run a six inch little, little loop knot and I'll tie a weight off. That's where I'll tie my weight. So my main line can free float. So that six inch line to, to my weight, that's going to hold me on the bottom and that's going to let my main line come up at six inches max off the bottom where I differ is I run different lengths of leaders. So if my fish, if I'm scanning fish and I see these fish and I think, okay, they're two or three feet off the bottom, then I'm going to run a shorter leader line because those fish are close to the bottom. If they're five feet off the bottom, I'm going to extend the length of my leader line so it drifts up higher. So my weight will hold hold it down at the barrel swivel, but then the current's going to pull my bait up in the air. Mm -hmm. So you run that longer leader, it'll pull that bait three or four feet up off the bottom. So changing, um, changing different leader lengths makes a big difference too. I mean, if, if your fish are five foot off the bottom and you got a short leader and, and you're fishing a foot off the bottom, you're out of the strike zone. So, I mean, there's so many little things that, that make up the recipe to consistently catching those catfish on the river. And it's, like I said, it's, it, it, they got it down to a science these days. And it's, it's all the little things like that that make huge differences. And when you start putting it together, like if you, if a couple guys go and you got six rods out, if we're just starting, uh, we used to run, you know, like six different leader links. And if once one rod start out performing everything else, well, then we'd pull it in and we'd say, okay, we've got a three foot leader. Every rod would get a three foot leader because that's where the fish were feeding. So you see what, you see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I do. It's like, com it's common sense, but you but also got to take, take the time to do it though. Too. Yeah. You know, you can't yeah. just throw the same thing that you caught, can't, you know, you caught fish. No. In the last and week or, or and I don't, I have a lot of buddies that spot fish and this goes along with what you were saying earlier about that river is always changing. It's always moving. So you might have a 40 foot hole this year, next year it ain't there, but you got, I got a bunch of buddies that they spot fish. They don't have electronics and stuff or they do, but they don't rely on them like they should. They don't have faith in them. Mm -hmm. So just because this year they caught a couple of fish there, they keep running back to that spot. It's a good spot. I don't spot fish. I don't set up on anything that I haven't found fish there first with my electronics. Electronics work. Lean on them. The more you do, the more confidence you'll get, the more fish you're going to catch. So That's huge. That, yeah. Right. What you just said, that applies to any kind of fish. It does. As bass fishermen, we're guilty to going back to the same old spots. The same bro. stretch this, bank that I, I caught them on. Yeah, this year. is this is a plastic yeah. worm bank. This is a crankbait yeah. bank. You know, we, yeah. we, we're all guilty of that. But we should be... Uh, Every day is a new day. We should be using what we have on our bot. Our Johnny boat. Schultz talks about that. He's a he's a fish the moment, and he talks about he delete he, he'll he'll find a spot and he'll whether it's a new body of water, whether it's Lake of the Ozarks, whether it's Table Rock where he's at. He fishes a section of the lake. He may make thirty or forty waypoints that day, but at the end of the day, he deletes everything. Yeah, because really? he, he wants that to force, go back and to... fish the moment fish what's in front of you yeah. that day not fishing history of that brush pile that's pretty legit yeah so i mean it takes some dedication right there it does like you did that a couple years ago where you deleted all of your waypoints yeah. off yeah. your graphs on purpose not on accident uh well at least that's what you told me it, it was, no, it was on purpose it was 100 uh, on purpose i was just frustrated because i couldn't i kept going back fishing history and i felt like i wasn't learning and i knew the the way the only way i could could wean myself off of it was to take 
all my waypoints and delete them. Now I still knew the areas. I still knew about where some of the stuff. Yeah, was. but they but weren't. I, but you but had to look at them all with new eyes again. Yeah, yeah. You had to relook exactly. at everything, and that changed the game, didn't it? It did. It helped. It helped me just Absolutely. think outside the box, and um, and that's that's where I'm at with the the less is more, and even like deer hunting, it it helped me huge in deer hunting. When I when I used to be super successful, and, and I love to I love to shoot big bucks. When I was super successful year after year, bagging my bucks, and then uh, hunting pressure really started picking up. Land started getting sold off and broke into smaller parcels. So every little piece had somebody different hunting. Hunting shows got really big. All every different uh, brand of hunting show had its brand of calls and and scents and. Um, everybody bought a backpack and had it full of rattle bags and scent bombs and <laughs> sprays and grunt calls. And I had, I struggled uh, for a couple of years in there because I had had great success calling deer. But when I, when I finally got to looking at it for what it was and actually what, what tipped me off to a lot of it was I could hear the guy on the neighboring property blowing on a grunt call like a trombone and banging antlers together the first week of bow season. And I'm like, okay, all right. I, I get it. I hear you. I understand. I took my calls out of my bag. I took my sense out of my bag. I, I went, I'm, I'm super big on scent control and always hunting the wind. I mean that I'll go fishing if I don't have the right wind. I'm not hunting. So I thought, I'm not going to alert the deer and let them hunt me anymore. I'm going to hunt the deer. When you're calling or you got sense out, that deer's coming in downwind, uh, a mature buck. He's going to try to get downwind to you every time. I don't want that deer hunting me. I want the element of surprise. So I'm going to scout harder. I'm going to pay more attention to the properties I'm hunting, figure out how the deer work the property I'm hunting, because consistently year after year, they'll work those properties the same because of the terrain, the lay of the land, the food source, the water source, it's in their DNA to run that property that way until we do something to force them to change. So I could kill a big buck running this ridge this year, and three years later, I could kill a big buck doing the same thing. Even even three years in a row, uh, I just am, am uh, the fourth year in a row of the stand I shot my buck out of the other day, fourth year in a row, same setup, same stand, shot shot a big buck out of it doing the same thing because the way the terrain is and the way those deer work that land. I didn't call any of them. I didn't use any sense. I played the win and I properly placed my stand. So less is more because I'm not doing any of that stuff anymore. I backed off all that and I've incorporated it to a lot of my fishing, especially with the live scope. It, it definitely helped, but uh, it's definitely made a huge difference for my success. Now, since I did that, I'm right back into, uh, I think I've killed uh, four 160s uh, bucks in the last five years, six years here. Wow. So, uh, it, which in my area that, I mean, those are studs, you know. So, and that's I don't it. care where you're at in the country, folks. Those are studs. <laughs> I just, I pay attention to how the deer work in the property and I'm as low impact as I can be. And I only hunt when the wind is right, when the conditions are the best. I've only been out six times this year. And, I mean, I, I got a good one down, you know. Um, less is more. I'm huge on that less is more. Yeah. That makes sense. You're Like you said, um, why get out there and spread your sin all over the woods when it's not the right day? You're just you – can. It, it, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like hooking fish in, in practice when you're pre-fishing for a tournament or, or even – letting the fish see your bait right you know that's mm -hmm. that's one of the advantage of using your electronics you can see the fish you don't even have to fish them because yep. there's a lot of guys that if you're throwing a big glide bait with no hooks that fish is only going to look at that bait once a week or something even though it doesn't have yep. any hook it doesn't matter he saw your bait well you're, you're, and this isn't we can we can even go a step farther this isn't just live scope eras i mean look at the heydays of kentucky lake in the the mid two thousands when they were put pumping out, you know, 25 pound stringers daily on the river ledges, mm -hmm. those guys fished for four days of practice and never put a, never pulled a rod out of the box. They were just, they had to know where they were at. 
that was before scanning. live scope they were just scanning yeah. yes and, side scan and most of those guys yeah. could probably still do it with 2d and triangulation like there's a yeah. lot of those old heads that can do all that absolutely right. now, and, and side so, scan like you said side scan is huge yeah there's not a day that you don't you go out fishing that you don't have your side scan on no i love my side scan i i think that's just as big of a tool as live scope it it definitely is very close for me because you can you can just access more more water. It gets you, you in can, the right area. You you can cover a lot more water, a lot more efficient with the side scan. I love the side scan, and like I tell guys, I, I've been doing, um, I've been doing uh, live scope classes, you know, on on the water on on their boat. And a couple of the guys, you know, I've helped them with their side scan because they didn't really know how to read it. And I told them, you know, I said, don't, you know, don't just go find one piece of structure and then spin around and mess with it. I said, scan a whole area, mark them all, and then right. come back mm -hmm. and check them out. You know, I said, it's it's so much more efficient and, and time effective to scan the whole bank, you know, pick an area and scan it all. You can mark them as you go, you know, mark all the spots as you go. Then you can circle back mm -hmm. and, and and zero in on them. You know, heck, I got waypoints I've never even fished. Right? Absolutely, I do too. I, I know what's there. You know, you mark them with whatever your 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 icon is. I, I have uh, all. I use all the icons on my graphs. Um, that way, I know what's there. Yeah, and it's kind of like deer hunting. You you go there on the, under the right conditions at the right time, and you don't screw it up by going in there when it's not right. That's right. So. Here's, here's one. How true you always hear these stories, man. How true are the stories of underwater welders? Uh, you know, the story of underwater welders when building the Alton Dam and, and big catfish. You always hear that huge man catfish. Eating catfish. Man eating catfish. Not, I've heard I've heard the same things. Yeah. Um I here's what gets me. Look at all the the biggest blue cat. And th this is a kick I kind of been on for a little while. All the record blue cats you have right now, all the, the close to the records, the previous records, those fish, for the most part, are all between about 57 and 60 inches long. They cap out at about the same length. You don't hear of many blues at all getting over that 60 inch, maybe, maybe a couple, 60 and a half, maybe to 61. So they peak out in that length, and it's all that extra weight in, in their girth. And you can see it even in the pictures. I don't – I think they're just what he says. I think they're stories, you know, a long story short. I don't think there's – I don't think there's blue cats, you know, down there that are as big as Volkswagens. Um, I just I, – I mean, I, I well, don't think they're that big. You well, know? let's be honest. If you're welding, guess what? You got to you – gotta, a shield on that you can't see out of essentially yep. and something appears right here <laughs> it looks really big it looks the really visibility, big absolutely it looks big i mean the visibility down there is terrible i mean i mean let's be honest if well you got, even a hundred pound if, if, you, if you see a hundred pound catfish face right your face, face that's a big fish well, think yeah. about and, and you're and you're under the water in his zone yeah it's going to look like a volkswagen in your face i believe yeah, exactly that. and your you head will fit in his foot, mouth huh? two foot of visibility if you're your lucky. head your head could fit in some of these fish's mouth yeah now yeah. that's a fact yeah but but um no you know uh i i don't i don't think the blue cat has the capability of growing that much um uh, somewhere along the lines somewhere. there somewhere along the lines there'd be one found bellied up dead somewhere yeah, somebody right. would have caught one on a trout line i mean it's they, they don't get that big and and it's to me that's one thing i i've been this year paying a lot of attention is the links um because it seems like that that 57 to 60 inch mark it's like they just cap out and I, i'm not sure why the links um, stop right there. It's just, but it's like largemouth in our area. Um, the biggest largemouth I've ever caught here was 23 and a quarter. I've heard guys tell me they've caught 24 and 25 inch largemouth. They didn't. That our strain doesn't get that long. That 23 and a quarter floored me. It was 10 pounds, 15 ounces. It floored me that it was that long. I mean, I've caught a lot of uh, I caught another one that was 23, but a lot of like 22 and three quarter, 22 yeah. and a half. 
And the girth is what's crazy different on those fish, just like these catfish. I'm not sure why the link caps out, um, but it does. I mean, have you ever caught a 24 inch, a legit 24 inch largemouth yeah. measured the right way? No, uh, my, no. my PB and Stephanie was Stephanie had a question a while ago, but talking about have, what's your PB, PB without, without life, life scope. All of my PBs are without yeah, life all scope. My, all my PBs are without life scope, but my PB bass was like 8'4 uh, out of cedar and it was That's 23, good. 23 inches, I think, or 23. When, and when did you catch that fish? That was in the 90s, early what, 90s. What time of year? In the winter, uh, March, late winter, early, late winter early spring. Yeah. Um, but 23 and a half, that's, and that's long. Mm -hmm. It was a good fish. That's very long. Yeah. yeah. Very long. Um, um, my, my PB. It might've been 22 and a half. I can't remember. My PB crappie, not on a live scope. My PB blue cat was with a live scope. My PB mm -hmm. flathead, no live scope. My PB channel cat, no live scope. My PB largemouth, no live scope. Uh, my PB hybrid, no live scope. Yeah, well, same here. I, I can go I, through. I, will, I can go through them all too. I will say that Southern Illinois, the the fisheries that that I fish have steadily gotten worse over the years. Not, and it's not because of live scope. It's just fishing pressure in general. Fishing pressure in general. It's gotten tougher. Well, sure. and, and a polymer good. knot is one of my favorite knots on the river. Okay. Now, do you when you you said you have? I and I'm I'm assuming, but. You know what happens when you assume you're not making a braid to mono connection. You're using a swivel or I got a barrel swivel. I run my braid to the barrel swivel and then my mono off of the same barrel swivel. I got you. I got you. Yep. Let's see here. Got a shout out from from Bass and Moon says, yeah. this guy is great. I've learned more in 20 minutes than I have in the past 10 years. I love it. I love it. Tom's got, the, he, he's heard the same stories down there on, uh, on oh, Kentucky, Kentucky Lake. Lake. Yeah. 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 Any, any dam, it doesn't matter what fishery it's on. There's, it the, there's the giant no matter, cat. The dam man. has the same story, seems like. I, the one that I remember is my grandfather telling a story that there was a guy that under a certain waterfall, I don't even remember what little stream it was on but the guy waited out there he had a rope tied to him stuck his hand down this catfish's mouth and he was scarred all the way up to his his arm and as a kid that sounds crazy but now that we think about it like if there was a guy that dove down and and was essentially noodling for catfish and he had scars all the way up to his like that's a hundred percent legit but that, that actually could be legit because like a flathead a flathead's one of the most aggressive predators that I've actually seen actually on live scope. That fish is a legit predator. I mean, when, when he is ready to eat, he means business and he's going to attack. I mean, whatever he can fit in his mouth. Right. So I, I know guys that, that uh, noodle and the guy, one of the, one of the guys had said, he said, you know, they knew they had this big flathead in the, in the log. And he, as soon as his hand got by his mouth, as they try to go in the mouth and out the gill, and then they, they got the fish, he can't get away. As soon as his hand got by the mouth, he said the fish actually engulfed his hand, just sucked his, like his arm up to the, to the elbow. You know, like it, it didn't know it wasn't something to eat. It ate it or tried to. So, I mean. God, that'd be yeah. scary. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, and, and I, I had a buddy. for those that noodle, you gotta you gotta have a couple screws loose. I apologize. You do. I'm I'm not I ain't I'm not doing it. I'm I not mean, sticking my hand in a log. Uh -huh. that, no, there's too that many snapping me. turtles and alligator snapping turtles, and you can nah. come back. <laughs> mm -mm. I I like my boat and a rod and reel. That's how I'm gonna catch stuff. But uh, <laughs> I, I was on, I was doing a live scope trip uh, today for for a guy today, and and um, he asked me if I ever use minnows. And I said, back in the day, you know, when I first started crappie fishing and stuff, we used minnows. And now it's just a personal preference. I prefer to try to outsmart them with, with the jig. Yeah. But I told them, like, right now, um, you you could use what we call like a naked minnow, uh, just just a regular, you know, unpainted lead head, a 16th or 8th ounce lead head, and, and just a, a minnow hooked, you know, 
through the bottom jaw out the top and drop that in. And you could, you could probably outfish the jigs right now, but knowing that I would rather go to the lake and catch a handful of fish fishing them my way than just dropping that minnow in there. But that, that's the difference of, I call them like meat hunters. Like those guys are meat hunting. They're looking to take a bag home, you know, and, and I got nothing against that. I have nothing against minnows or live bait of any sort. It's just a personal preference I have that I want to outsmart them with the jig. Like, I mean, I'm throwing them back anyways, most of the time. So that's just, that's the game I want to play, you know, but there's times when it's very effective, you know, and, and, you know, you, you can definitely get on the fish, but I I'd rather, I'd rather struggle to catch them with my jig, I guess. Yeah. Um, than use the minnow but yeah, again was, it's personal preference i was eating lunch with a buddy of mine as a high school buddy of mine that we used to we used to go fishing together all the time and he he's he doesn't fish hardly at all i mean he might go once a year um but he had sent me a text he's like hey where can i get live bait at because a buddy of his was coming in town they wanted to go fishing and <clears throat> i only knew of two places in in jackson I didn't know of any place in Cape. And so we ate lunch and um, we got to talking and I said, man, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't really have any suggestions on someplace local to you to, to pick up bait. And I said, cause I, I don't use live bait. I haven't used live bait. And for, I mean, I'm mainly bass fish and gosh, it's been, I don't know when it's been. I think, I think actually the last time I bought minnows was about five years ago. Cause my sister and, her boyfriend and his kids were coming into town for Christmas and he wanted me to take them crappie fishing in the pond behind my house. And I bought a, I had to buy a minnow bucket. I had to buy a minnow mm -hmm. net and everything, the whole nine yards. Yeah. And I bought like a couple dozen of, of minnows, but I just don't fish live bait all that much, but it is there's it's situations where it's the way to go. For well, sure. the closest thing that I've got to live bait in the last couple of years was going over to, I think it was Academy or, maybe even sea balls over there in Jackson and, and I got some mealworms so we can go catch some bluegill. And yeah. it was, it was for my son. He was probably five or six at the time. And you know what? A, a bucket of meal or a, a, a little jar of mealworms and a, and a float is, is heaven for a five or six. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, I, I, like I said, I have nothing against no. the, the live bait and live minnows and stuff. It's just a personal preference. I just, I prefer to try to do it, you know, my way, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. and, and at the end of the day a bow versus a rifle or a crossbow. Yeah. yeah. And at other at the end of the day, when you do it your way and you're successful, I mean, you feel really good about what you've done. I mean, uh, it, it's, it, it's rewarding, you know, it's a, a self victory to me, you know, yeah. like every day. And I don't care who I have in the boat with me. Uh, everybody's so competitive. If you're in my boat, we're not having a competition, uh, at least not against me and you. It's us against the fish. And my goal is we're going to beat them fish and put them in the boat. We're not going to give up till we do. And we, I don't care if we work together. I don't care who catches them. We're going to we're against the fish, not against each other. Right. Uh, uh, it, it, it just it's not too many people. It's all about a competition. At the end of the day, I don't want my buddies talking about, man, you really outfished me today. I'm like, no, I didn't. I outfished the fish, you know. Yeah. That, right. That's what it's all about. Well, it's because we live in a we live in this social media world where we have to be judged and compared to to everything. We had I had this conversation with a guy this past weekend about I showed you the deer that my buddy killed. And one of the guys in camp was was kind of dogging him a little bit about killing that deer. I'm like, dude, he's happy about it. Who cares? Like he's the one that chose to to draw back on that deer and shoot that deer, not, not you. So be happy. Congratulate him that he, he made a quick, clean, ethical kill. Yeah. And he was happy with what he's got and he's got food on the table. That's and, right. And a trophy to put on the wall. Like, he's happy with it. Let him be happy with it. Yeah. It wasn't 180 inch deer, but it was, it was what he wanted that day. So that is a, that conversation has been coming up a lot. And I hate that conversation. I do too. Go out and kill a spike buck. You bought it's the your tag. tag. Yes. You, you yep. spent the time. Right. You're going to take it to the processor or you're going to process it yourself. You're going to put in the time and the work for it. I don't care what you do with it. As long as you don't kick it out of the back of the truck on the side of the highway, I don't care. I don't either. There, there was a funny meme that I seen, and it, it hit home big time. 
they had a tree stand in the tree with a skeleton in the tree. And it said, me waiting on a buck that meets everybody else's standards. Yep, and I'm like, I saw that it, same one. That, it couldn't have gotten no more accurate than that. Yep. And that's that's what's crazy. That's where we've gotten. Like you said, if it's a trophy to you or it puts a smile on your face, if it makes you happy, take it. You're hunting for you. It's your time. It's your tag. Hunt for you. And and that's where that's how it should be. And and then you got guys that will kill they'll kill a deer. Uh it might be a small buck, whatever. And then they feel like in their posts they got to justify, well, I haven't saw nothing and I needed some meat and it's meat in the freezer. No, congratulations on killing that deer. You know, good right. job. I don't care what the antlers are on there. I choose to trophy hunt for me. I don't care what the next guy does, you know. Right. I mean, hunt for you and what makes you happy is what you put your tag on. You bought a tag just like the next guy down the street That's from it. you, dude. So, That's I mean, it. the the best kill that I've I've had, the two best hunts in the woods that I've ever had. I didn't I never pulled the trigger. Yep. And and one of them nothing died that day. Yep. So, one of them was with my dad, and I got to call turkeys in for my dad to about three feet. Oh. And nobody had a shot at three feet, which is insane. <laughs> um, he should have just grabbed their. I know, right? Like, <laughs> but if you're if you're a turkey hunter or anybody that's around you's been a turkey hunter at three feet, that's pretty awesome and insane, right? Like, absolutely. And hear him coming up the ridge and gobbling right on the other side of the ridge, and it just gets your hair standing up. And the the other one happened two weeks ago with my son killing his first deer. So yeah, yeah, that's like, awesome. And, and I didn't, it, it hit home with him. So I'll tell you the story. Had a, had a doe come out, had a little buck come out and chase. And I, the, he had a split second to try to shoot the buck and wasn't, everything didn't line up. I don't think a, a seasoned hunter like myself or yourself would have been able to make the shot that quick. Right. Um, chased the, the deer out to about 150 yards. And we haven't practiced that far. We've practiced at 50 to a hundred. Like, yep. and that's where we're comfortable at. And, uh, I wouldn't let him take the shot and the, the, the buck had ran off and he, he had crosshairs on the buck. And I, I just, I told him, I said, no, well, like we're not taking that shot. It's not an ethical shot I'm trying to teach him the right things. Right. Absolutely. Uh, now if you, if we practice at 150 yards and we were driving tax at 150 yards, I would let you take that shot every day of the week, yep. but not tonight. And, uh, so the buck ran off and I was like, so you saw the buck, you saw the doe, like, or do you want to hold out for a buck, bud? And he's like, absolutely not, Dad. I want to kill what the what the first thing that walks out. I'm like, that's what it's about. He just wants that's to have. It. He just wants that's to enjoy it. the hunt mm-hmm. and the the harvest of an animal. Yep. Uh, and w- when when that deer walked out, he made an absolute perfect shot. I couldn't ask awesome. a better shot. Uh, but he put the time in. He practiced the summer with with a 22, and then we went out with the new rifle and. You know, he went through the whole steps of, of how this, this process works. And then he got to see, he actually got the blood trail of deer because dear old dad can't blood trail a deer. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm colorblind. So oh, that, that makes a big difference. Makes it real tough to, to yeah, blood trail one in the rain. So, oh uh, man. Fortunately, I had my, one of my best friends there with me that uh, he was able to help us, help us get it, get her out and, and make the, make the good quick recovery but i hear i because i i we found the our keegan found the blood up top my son did and uh i was like well I'm, i'll stand here like you guys go down below the hill like i can't help you out like i'm just stumbling around <laughs> just causing issues more than anything and uh, i hear him down in the woods like here's here's blood here's blood here's blood here's blood and That's awesome. that, i see my buddy and he looked up and he kind of shook his head he already knew he already saw the deer where it went but he let keegan follow the blood trail all the way to the deer that's awesome. It was, it was, you can see the smile on my face. I was, I was a, I was oh, a yeah. Those, those moments are priceless. Yeah. He'll priceless. remember that one before any video game or any, you know, yep. Any movie. That might have well, well. might just well been a 200 incher. Yep. I yep. mean, it's, yeah, I love that. That's good stuff. Yes. Yeah. Sir. I think of, uh, I'll, we'll touch on this for a little, little bit longer and then wrap it up. But, um, you don't always have to, harvest the animal or catch the fish to be you know a memorable experience I, i've told this before but it's been a long time ago probably my best top water blow up ever bass fishing is a fish that i didn't catch 
Yep. And I was throwing a frog over some grass in the fall. And it literally, I, this explosion was so massive that I, 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 I just stopped. I was, I was stunned and I kept looking for a beaver. I thought for sure that a beaver had smacked the top of the grass somehow, even though I know there wasn't a beaver in the area and there was a hole. I mean, you hear, a, you hear the, the hole the size of a trash can lid or I, I swear that that's exactly what happened. I have no idea how big this fish was, but I had to actually stop for about five minutes and just kind of, yeah. I, I had to, my mind and what I saw wasn't, wasn't sinking up. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 that had to be like a, a rock fell out of the sky right. or it was just a massive blow up. But in that moment, I didn't have any picture, you know, but mm -hmm. it was still, it was still. You didn't just, need one. You got a picture. I didn't need one. Yeah. Yeah. You'll never picture lose. was in my head. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I, didn't have, I didn't have a picture You'll to never share lose. with anybody else but myself. Yeah. And it was, the uh, amount of water that those big fish, those big, big largemouth can, yeah. the amount of water they upset on, on a good topwater blow up. It's, it's phenomenal. I mean, it's a whole different level. It ain't, it ain't like five, six pounders. My PB on top water is eight, six. And that fish upset the water like nobody's business. I mean, it was, <laughs> it's a big it, fish. It, it's, it's way different. But heck, I've even seen those four and five pounders that just drop the bottom out of the lake. Yeah. Oh, they, they can be aggressive, but it's, it's just a, like the, the, that's how I described to my buddies. It's just the amount of water than big fish upset, you know, it, it's crazy. It's like, you know, that fish was on a whole nother level. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Stephanie, she says, uh, she can, she can tell myself that when fishing, but it's hard to be happy when the other person is catching three or four pounders and you're catching dinkers. Um, you I gotta know. Watch them. Gotta watch them. Yeah. I'm, I mean, throw them out of the boat. We, we, the we've all been in that boat in that, I've been in the scenario. You, I think you and I've done it in the same boat, like fishing the same lure, same setup, same everything down the bank, and one of you is catching them and the other one's not. And holding your mouth right. And the guy that's <laughs> in the, the back end is the one that's that's whipping your butt, and you're in the yeah. front. I've had that happen too many times. So. It, it is. It's and it's it's little things. Um, it's a little twitch, a little twitch of the rod hand. It's mm -hmm. a pause in the in the cranking. Any little thing, all you have to do is change something up slightly from the other guy and you can catch all the fish using the same lure. It's the little things. And my, my daughter, my youngest daughter, Chelsea, she, she's so competitive. She's always in the boat trying to beat me, actually outfished me and my buddy one day, uh, bass fishing. And this girl pays attention to everything. So I'm always trying to hide my stuff from her. <laughs> we mess with each other big time. So I try to hide what I'm doing and I'll pump the crankbait uh, or I'll, I'll just be steadily reeling and kill it. Just briefly kill it and then real kill it, real kill it. And this this girl's constantly if I'm if I'm catching fish, she's staring me down and trying to be on the download. But she's she's watching like a hawk and then she'll start doing it and catching the fish. And it's just it's funny. She's she's really competitive. When, when it comes to that. And that's it's just that's awesome. Man. Man. She's I, observing I, like that. I love to hear that. Oh, she is. Because most of us that are, are hardcore bass heads, we just fish harder and harder and harder. And it kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier. Is that, is that kiss method. Keep it simple, stupid. Like, yeah. you're overthinking, you're overprocessing all this information. And more times than not, you know, there's there's guys that tell the story about, you know, you take a buddy fish and he's just out there just to cast in a way. He doesn't have a care in the world. And all of a sudden he's, I got one. It's like, oh, you got a five pounder. All right, cool. Yep. Like, good job. And then. You're 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 trying, right? You're giving her mm -hmm. the, the old college try, and he's back there just <laughs> oh, he's fishing it. Nah, and just yeah. just having a good old time. Yeah. He's fishing it a, a way that you're not fishing it because he doesn't know yeah. the way that yeah. you're supposed to be yeah. fishing. You know, he's it he's probably reeling in, and he stops and scratches his head and reels it in and shoes to fly away, and he don't realize, man, that that's a really good technique, you know. Mm -hmm. But he's he's accidentally doing it and catching the fish. Yep. Yep. I yep. uh. I wanted to learn crankbaits. I, I fished a lot of jigs, a lot of plastic worms, a lot of top waters. I never fished a crankbait a lot. Um, and I wanted to really get good with a crankbait. So I bought all kinds of crankbaits, different brands, different depth diving crankbaits, square bills, coffin bills. I mean, just all kinds of different crankbaits. And I left all the rest of my gear at home. I, I 
at first I would take the crankbaits with me, but I had so much confidence in everything else that I would get away from the crankbait in five minutes. And so finally I wanted to learn them so bad. I left all the rest of my gear at home and I only took the crankbaits to my bass lake and I forced myself to use them. And I got extremely good with a crankbait to the point where I built up so much confidence with that crankbait that, I mean, it's, it's pretty much my go-to. Hmm. And uh, I, I had a guy that actually was my boss at work and him and a buddy of his was fishing the same lake that I fished regular where most all my big bass came from and they they would fish it all day and they would catch you know two three four fish when i would be on it half the day the same day they were and catch 25 30 40 fish so they would question me all the time like you're not really fishing that later you ain't really catching all them so i would take pictures on my iphone of every fish it time stamps them it dates them so I, I caught this one at 10, 12, and this one at 10, 18, and this one at 10, 37. So I end up buying a boat off of him. And he said, okay, he said, I'm going to cut you a deal on the boat, but you're throwing a fishing trip in to, to that lake in with the deal. So I said, I'll take you fishing. So we're at work one day, working 12-hour shifts. It's in the summer. It's 100 degrees out. It's in the middle of summer. It's, it's August, early August. I mean, it's hot. The water's hot. And um, we were on the floor and it was about three o'clock in the afternoon. And I said, hey, I said, have your stuff at the boat ramp at seven o'clock tonight and be ready when I get there. And he just laughed and he went on. And then, well, of course, he was a boss. So he got off at three thirty. You know, I'm still there till six o'clock. So he calls me about five thirty. He says, hey, man, are you serious about having my stuff at the ramp? I said, yeah, I, one thing I don't joke around about is fishing, especially bass fishing. I said, you have your stuff at the ramp. I'm taking you today. We're going to go catch them. He said, dude, it's it's 100 degrees, and the water's 90 degrees, and we're not going to catch no fish. I said, don't worry about it. You just have your stuff at the ramp. He didn't know. I'd been hitting that lake. I was on a solid crankbait pattern. So we get up there, and I, I hand him a crankbait. And... Um, He's like, oh, I don't, I don't need that. I got my own baits. I said, you don't, do you have this one? No. I said, this is what they're eating. Put it on. He said, but it, it's, it's a hundred degrees out here. They're not chasing a crankbait. I said, I don't need them to chase it. You'll see. Just tie it on. Well, it, you know, I knew where they, these fish were hanging out. They, there was deadfalls and stuff in the water. So it, we had a thermal climb in there, but they were suspended on these, on these tops uh, and the ends of these brushes um, in about eight foot of water, seven, eight foot of water. You know, they might've been in 25 feet of water, but they were suspended on the structure in seven, eight foot of water. So we were, we were running the crankbait right into the brush. It just, I said, bang the limb and just stop. And then pause about three seconds to start reeling. And most of the time when you start reeling again, it just loaded up. You know, I wasn't asking those fish to chase that bait in 90 degree water temp. I was taking the bait to them, smacking the limb, and I was getting a reaction strike. So after I caught about the, the fifth fish, he finally decides to tie this crankbait on. So there's one other boat on the lake. And we pull up on one of my favorite points. It's got a big deadfall right off of it. And the end of it is that perfect zone where these fish are hanging out. And this is all pre-live scope. So we pull up. I see the guy jig fishing the point. He's pitching at the bank. His boat is sitting over the top of the fish. So I sit and wait. And he's like, man, we ain't got much time left. You know, it's about dark. What are you doing? I said, I'm going to wait till he's done. We're going to pull up there and catch a big fish. <laughs> he said, he's, fi he's been fishing that point for probably 30 minutes. I said, do you see what he's doing? Well, yeah, he's jig fishing. I said, he's not fishing for the same fish we are. We'll wait till he goes, then fish it. He ain't bothered them fish a bit. So as soon as he pulled around the bank, we eased up and I made a long cast out off the end of that tree, ran that right in, banged the limb, paused. And when I started to reel in, I had a five pounder on there. And he's like, I, I can't even believe it. I said, <laughs> you can't let what somebody else is doing uh, affect what you're going to do. I said, watch him. I said, them fish, he didn't bother him. They didn't even know he was there. They didn't care about him. They were doing their own thing. And I'm not asking that fish to, to chase that bait. But if you 
put that in the strike zone, especially bang that limb or hit the limb and run down the limb a little bit with that crankbait, you're going to get a reaction strike. And we caught 15 fish that day um, in just a couple hours before dark. And, and we had some quality fish on them crankbaits. And it was just like, it was eye opening. But it was the very first cast I made that day. It was funny. We pull up and I, I got a big crankbait and I got a long crankbait rod and, and, you know, I got a loose speed spool, the thing I throw a country mile. And I make a cast, you know, position the boat just right. Boat positions everything. You guys know that. Mm -hmm. I position the boat right, make a far cast. I mean, I don't even know, far. And I, I got my bait in the strike zone, kept it there as long as I could, banged a couple limbs on the way back. And, and he's like, oh, my gosh. And I'm like, he freaked out as soon as I cast it. And I'm, I turn, I'm like, what is what? What's the matter? Like, do you get stung by a bee or what, you know? He said, you just casted that thing 60 yards. So at the end of the day, you know, he says, uh, I believe you on, on all the fish you were catching. He said, I didn't realize. He said, not only was we not playing the same game, he said, we wasn't even playing the same sport. You know, he's, and that's you know, I'll define things like guys that like to fish and fishermen, guys that like to hunt and hunters. You know, I mean, there's always multiple layers to everything and multiple categories to everything. And it's it's the guys that have the dedication that pay extra attention and watch everything. Those are your successful guys. Those are the fishermen. Those are the hunters, not just somebody who likes to get out there and do things. And that success and that level of it is what always drives me to keep going and to keep learning and to keep getting better. That's good stuff, man. We're going to, we're going to end on that, man. That That was solid. (laughs) That was, that was, there was a lot there and that's, that's got me thinking, you know, I need to be sliding out a little deeper and, yeah. changing up tactics when i'm not getting bit doing something else. it's just good to hear this stuff this is stuff that's um nuggets that just need to be refreshed you know they oh, just absolutely. need to be polished off and, and put in oh, your it, brain and you know over and over it is and you know um i i got a buddy i fish with very regular that we used to bass fish all the time and first thing in the morning you know day at, at daybreak or just before we're top water fishing and tearing them up and the top water bite shuts off like a light switch you know the sun gets up and my buddy's ready to pack it in and i said well we ain't leaving that that ended we're gonna follow the fish so we switched up and we got on a square bill bite and we patterned them again wore them out again and he's like well man that was a good day it's 11 11 30 in the morning we're done i said we ain't done we're switching up again we're just the fish they didn't quit they just they just moved out a little bit and we we pulled out with some big 10 inch worms and fished fished uh, some deeper brush in the mid you know 12 15 foot range and wore them out again three different legit tactics and patterns we put on those fish in a half day of fishing right. when when a lot of guys would have gave it up you know thought oh the bite's done you know it ain't done it's, well they went to the they would go to the lake with a preconceived notion where they're they're going to catch them on the top water yeah. And then I don't know what I'm going to do after that, but we'll figure it out maybe. Or if yeah. not, we'll just go to the house. You know, Absolutely. That's what you said, the difference between a, a, a guy that likes to fish and, and a true fisherman, guy mm-hmm. likes to hunt and a true hunter. So, that's right. Amen to that, brother. Always different levels of everything. That's right. That's right. Yeah, well, hey, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. It was a good time. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was awesome hanging out with you. Um, any closing thoughts or any shout outs or anything thing like that? No. Uh, I'd like to uh, just give a shout out to Jackham Jigs, the custom hand tied hair jigs. Uh, they, I'm on the pro staff there. They make a quality, quality product. I've caught a lot of fish on them. Of course, Bluff City. I'm on the pro staff there. They take good care of me. I mean, good, good customer service. A lot of good products. A lot of good stuff on hand, and they're very helpful. You know, if you don't know what you're after, go in there and tell them what you want to do. They'll get you lined out. Um, yeah. Canine fishing products, definitely, definitely awesome, awesome fishing line. And uh, um, outlaw crappie rods, most sensitive rods I've had in my hands, uh, hands down. And sometimes that's the difference on a great day. Yeah, no doubt, man. No doubt. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, everybody out there for 
hanging out with us. Uh, we will see you uh, same time, same place next week. And thanks again, Eric. No problem. Thank you.